to help each other. Um, and I always ask Syrians, I'm saying, okay, what is what is your biggest need? Do you need healthcare or food or shelter or education? What do you need? And almost always the answer they give me is we wish that we could work. Just let us work and we can take care of ourselves. Like we don't want to be dependent on the on the NGOs and just, you know, lying there taking handouts. And I would share to go this man, he said, you know, if we could work, Syrians would help Syrians and we would solve 50% of the problems on our own. Um, there and even right now people are still not allowed to legally work but people are already mobilizing in many ways like there is a team here called the Moham team um, there are a bunch of Syrian refugees in their 20s uh, they or organized this team named after Moham their friend who was killed in Syria and they have a Facebook page where they write about vulnerable cases who aren't being covered by the UN and then they crowdfund um, they crowdfund donations mostly from expats uh, Syrian expats in the West and then they they use that money to try to help these people. So, for example, this is this is they were just doing a Ramadan distribution, giving out shoes and clothes to the kids. Uh, in Jordan, these guys are Sudanese, and they're holding an Arabic English dictionary. Um, and there's a group in Jordan that trains refugees to teach English to other refugees. So they take the more highly educated ones, give them some teaching instructions, and then they teach English from six to nine. Uh -huh, PM three nights a week. People come after work, and so you'll walk in, you'll see a Syrian or a Sudanese man with a class of fifty Iraqis uh, and Somalis, and they teach them English, and they get paid an informal income for that. Uh -huh. This is um, a woman in Zarka who started a salon in her home, and a lot of women get really creative with the kind of work that they can do. And this woman, Fadia, she's Iraqi, and I remember her so clearly because <laughs> she was really exuberant and just really happy. Um, and she has been a refugee in Jordan for a long time, but she recently she started a leather work business. So she gets secondhand leather, um, you know, bags, skirts, and things. She cuts up the leather and makes belts, wallets, and sells them at tourist shops. And her business is really working well <laughs> because there's a there's a loophole in the laws where home-based businesses are not illegal, and you can you can do something from home. So right now there are some NGOs trying to work with that to promote livelihoods. And she's actually training Syrian and Palestinian women in Zarqa now, um, and just kept telling me like, oh, <laughs> I'm not leaving. You know, I I like it here. I feel like I can. I have agency over my own life. I can choose what I want to do, and it's great. Um, uh, of course, for many refugees, they are still waiting for her, their ultimate solution, which is, well, there are three durable solutions. One is you know, assimilation into your host country, which won't happen in Jordan. The other two, one is return to your home country once it's better. That looks un really unlikely for Sudan, Iraq, Syria. Um, and the third one is resettlement. Um, and this is a Sudanese man, Mohammedan, who was resettled last year after he had been in Jordan for 11 years um, as a refugee, waiting for his papers to be processed. But he finally got sent to the US. Now he lives in Richmond, or close to Richmond, Virginia. Um, They're having a big party for him. I went to see him off at the airport, and they had two full buses of Sudanese refugees came <laughs> and had a, like a huge send off for him. Um, but in the meantime, those who can't get resettled, uh, survive best when they can do something again this is a this is um the a physical therapy rehabilitation center for child amputees that's where i met that girl i told you guys about um so most of these kids they lost their limbs in the war um and they also lost their parents uh and so the people here it's the remarkable thing about the center is it's run all by Syrians and for Syrians. Like this woman on the end next to me, uh, Um Khalid, she told me she used to work as a nurse with uh, Red Crescent in Syria with Iraqi refugees. And she told me, you know, I never thought I would be a refugee myself. But, I mean, okay, here I am. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I can't keep doing something. Um, so there are, here are some points of ways forward, looking ahead, what to do since the Syrian crisis is not ending. I like this quote from Fadi Haliso. He's the founder of Basman Zaytuna. This is the group in Shatila camp that's training women to sew and embroider. And he's saying the most dangerous thing is to lead people to despair, which I fully affirm. And it's true because it's the people who despair, they are the ones who go to desperate measures. They go on the boats trying to cross the Mediterranean, trying to get to Italy, and then the boats capsize, they don't make it. <laughs> or, you know, they go towards crime, or they just go back to Syria, exposing themselves to violence and essentially being willing to die. Uh -huh. But as long as people have some kind of hope and some kind of feeling that they can't do something to keep going, um, they won't resort to these measures. <laughs> 
I'll see <laughs> this picture is from a family I met in Lebanon. Uh, this little girl, uh, Shahid, she's two years old. She doesn't know she's a refugee. Um, she was just she was just really happy and um, I could see that I was there with their family during Eid al-Fitr at the end of Ramadan and you could see the whole family trying as hard as they could to pretend that nothing is wrong and celebrate with her and buy her a new dress and say Eid Mubarak oh we're so happy and she would say why can't we go to the carnival we went to last year and they'd be like oh anyway like let's just be happy this is her grandma here who was in her 90s and was telling me um, about growing up uh, her, in her Syrian village and the lemon trees and the jasmine. She actually went back to Syria um, after I visited them. She told me, you know, I'm at the end of my life. I don't really care. I just want to be in Syria. I, I'm not going to leave. Uh, um, but I, I, I wanted to um, end on this quote from another woman, Um Ayman. I was asking her about, again, what she thinks about what the world thinks about refugees, like, you know, this narrative that they are weak and they're vulnerable, they can't do anything, and she was saying, yeah, it's true, like, we are weak, but we haven't forgotten our dignity, and our hearts are broken, but we haven't lost our honor. I'm Syrian, and I'm still proud to be Syrian, and I think the message that they would want to send is that what they want is not pity and handouts, but they want support, and they want people who can give, help them have opportunities to further themselves um, so that ultimately they can rebuild so kids like Shahid can grow up and go back to Syria and you know have a more peaceful future. Um, and that is all that I look forward to your questions. Okay. All right, questions for Alice? You have to have questions. Ask questions. <laughs> you can I'll, I'll run the mic. Oh, I, I, I can be really loud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> can you show the slide? How do you show the slide? Oh, I'll go get it. Okay. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, you go to all these different places that seem mm -hmm. kind of dangerous, especially for a girl. <laughs> um, do you always go with a person that that accompanies you or how do you get to these places and how do you find out about it? Uh, um, it depends on where I am going. <laughs> so I, I feel like most of the places in Jordan are really not dangerous. Jordan's a very stable place with a very strong public security, military and police presence right now because of the threat from Daesh. Um, I think the most dangerous place I went for my reporting would be Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. There are a lot of Hezbollah-controlled areas. But when I went, I went with a Syrian friend who I knew and trusted, and he was very clear about which areas we were going to and not going to. And usually I also communicate with my editors and tell them beforehand, hey, today I'm going to this place. I'm going to check in, you know, in 12 hours, you know, make and I keep in touch to make sure that things are okay. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Yeah. Alice, thank you. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You have to like, talk like this. Hi, Alex. <laughs> your presentation is really interesting. So you talked about going to Lebanon and you talked about going to Jordan. I don't know. Have you gone to the refugee camps in Turkey? Or perhaps do you know more information about them through you know, other journalists' yeah. friends? And I'm just wondering how is, are the conditions different because of how the Turkish government is dealing with it? I haven't, although I really badly want to go um, to the camps in Turkey. I, what, from what I hear, people say that the Turkish government is experimenting with, you know, allowing Syrians to have these kind of um, not full-on work permits like a Turkish person would, but allowing them to work a little bit and get by. And I've heard that that's a good thing, but I haven't gone. I haven't seen myself personally. I do know that there are a lot of Syrian refugees still there begging in the streets. Uh -huh, when you go walk around just Istanbul. So I wouldn't say that the situation is rosy. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit more about the situation of the Palestinians who came over from Syria? Um, I assume they're getting support from uh, UNRWA. <laughs> but yeah. kind of how they fit in kind of between the, the original Palestinian refugee groups and then kind of yeah. Syrians, how they're being treated and getting aid and that. Yeah, I think yeah, I wrote a piece about PRS, Palestinian refugees from Syria for the Atlantic, and I think they really are um, among the groups that are suffering the most from this conflict. Um, they are, uh, so Palestinians are dealt with by UNRWA, not by UNHCR, uh, and 
a lot of aid agencies don't deal with them because they say, okay, this is owner owned territory, so they can handle it. Um, I think the main problem for the Palestinians is that they weren't able to get out, um, and they're being blocked at the borders because they come to the borders. There are people who live in Syria, so they're under the exact same risk, the same bombings, the same war, the same fighting, but because they're technically, they're not Syrian, um, they're Palestinian, so they're being denied. And the difference between their denial and the other Syrians now is that the Jordanian government acknowledged it. Um, and they said, you know, um, you know, we, we can't deal with this problem here. <laughs> this this isn't our problem to solve. Uh -huh. What there was a quote that was really good, and it was some 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 quote about how this problem is you know an Israeli and Palestinian problem, and we shouldn't solve it on our territory. Uh -huh. But in general, Palestinian refugees from Syria are really suffering. Uh -huh. Yarmouk camp in Syria is one of the in one of the most dire humanitarian situations right now. Um, and there was a picture that was really widely shared about last year of you know, mass starvation that was essentially happening in Yarmouk. And from what I read from UNRWA, it hasn't gotten any better. So, so yeah. no Palestinians have crossed over into Jordan? No, some have. Um, a bunch of them did in the beginning, and they lived in a different camp called Cyber City. Um, yeah, but they were not being treated well, and then they started getting deported, uh, denied and then deported. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's great. Um, you talked a little bit about how ISIS is using economic value to uh, recruit their fighters um, out of the uh, out of the refugee population. Can you talk a little bit about how Hezbollah is potentially doing the same thing with easier access to the refugees? Okay, <laughs> I can't talk that much about it because <laughs> I don't know if it's happening or not. <laughs> um, I can imagine that it is <laughs> that in the in the same situation people want to find some way to survive, maybe they would go fight with Hezbollah. I also know, though, that a lot of Syrians in Lebanon are suffering because of Hezbollah, especially in Arsal, in the border towns where there are clashes um, between, you know, Syrian fighters and the Lebanese army. I remember specifically that at the end of last summer when the there was shelling going on in Arsal, there were about, I was getting texts from my Syrian friends who were there, and they were telling me there were about 15, 16 informal camps, informal refugee settlements that were being caught in the shelling, and nobody could get to them because there was ongoing fighting, but they were just in the middle, um, stuck on the border. So, so there, yeah. oh, Amanda can choose. <laughs> um, I yeah. just wanted to follow up on the question about Palestinian refugees, and I wanted to know um, if you could talk a little about your experience with Jordanians and those uh, Palestinian descent from 1948, the kind of like initial wave, mm -hmm. um, those not the ones from Syria. What kind of, what is it, what are Jordanians talking about? What mm -hmm. do they say about those who have now been there 60, whatever years? Uh -huh. How are they treated versus the, like the new waves that are coming in? How, how are they treating the Syrians or how are they no, treating? The those are Palestinians. Uh -huh. Those who come in? Have, no, those who have been there now for generations. Okay. Versus like those that are coming from Syria, like mm -hmm. are they, is there a different treatment? How do Jordanians feel about the refugees that have been there now for generations? How do Jordanians treat the Palestinians who've been in Jordan for generations yeah. versus the new ones coming like, in? Like now there's so many new waves of refugees um, coming in, and yeah. this was like already a problem from, you know, obviously generations ago. Does that make yeah. sense? <laughs> um, I mean, I think the Palestinians who have been in Jordan since the beginning, they're essentially integrated into Jordan. They're, they're like Jordanians. Um, when you talk to them, you'll say like, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm Jordanian. Oh, I'm, I'm actually Palestinian. Oh, my grandfather was in Haifa or in Akka or wherever. But uh, practically in terms of living, in terms of how they interact with each other people, it's they're, they're just like, they, they get along with Jordanians. Um, and there's not, it's even, it's hard to distinguish. You can tell by people's names, but if you just look at people walking on the street, you won't say like, this side of the street is the Jordanians, these are the Palestinians. They're essentially mingled together. Um, and then the p new ones who would come, as Palestinians from Syria, I would say they're also they're treated like Syrian refugees um, from a, from a Jordanian public point of view. Yeah. Take this here. Oh, you can raise your hand higher. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the um, the Jordanians themselves, both the hospitality, the sort of incredible mm -hmm. hospitality they show, but also the frustration and resentment they have yeah. because of all these people who do day jobs and such and yeah. take their labor away. Um, so in general, I think, in, to make a generalization, the Jordanian public is a lot more receptive to Syrians than the Lebanese are. I saw a lot of just horrible um, resentment and hatred 
hatred in Lebanon towards the Syrians. In Jordan, most people, they feel bad. You know, they say like, shame, this is shame that this is happening. You know, we pity the Syrians, why is this happening? And a lot of them go really far out of their way to help the Syrian refugees. There are so many community-based organizations, grassroots groups that are doing charity work. Um, at the same time, <laughs> you'll hear just a lot of daily resentment um, from, you, again, you can't generalize. There are people who are kind and generous and other people who are just annoyed. You know, they'll just say, Syrians came and they destroyed our country and they're messing everything up. You know, like I was in the taxi last week and there was traffic and the driver was like, this is because of the Syrians. Since the Syrians came, we have traffic. And I was thinking, you don't think it's because of the public transportation infrastructure that doesn't exist. Um, but on, on the whole, on the whole in Jordan, at least they have it, they haven't treated them with violence, um, which is not the case in Lebanon. There have been violence and abuse. Um, in Jordan, mostly they're they're just they're okay, they're annoyed, but they're they're okay. I have a naive question. I'm just trying to put myself in the position of somebody who's a professional with four years worth of living expenses and savings. And then I think, well, you know, why didn't I early on um, do something uh, peculiar, you know, like get on an airplane and go to some place far outside the region and overstay my tourist visa in a place like Mexico, let's say, um, or uh, Australia or wherever I could get in, you know, as a wealthy Syrian yeah. <laughs> early on, was it that I didn't think it was going to last for four years and I wanted to stay nearby so that the situation would resolve itself? How, yeah. how did I get caught hypothetically in this situation where yeah. I'm a college English professor and four years mm -hmm. later I'm uh, penniless and stuck? Mm -hmm. Well, first thing is that. Okay. <laughs> she was saying, if she, if you picture yourself as a, you know, um, professional with a upper and middle class income, and you're well off, uh, why would you not think? Why would you not think at the beginning of the crisis? Oh, I should just quickly fly somewhere else, go to Australia, Germany, or somewhere, uh, um, and and you know, wait it out there, overstay my tourist visa. Uh, why, why would you get caught in this situation? I want to say that I think many people did actually do that. <laughs> a lot of better off Syrians, they left, they went to France or they went to wherever, Germany, the US. Uh, and a lot probably did think that it wasn't going to last as long. I think, yeah, most Syrians that I meet um, were surprised that Syria became like this. Especially if you remember, this happened in 2011, right? It started with the Arab Spring when it seemed like everything was going to, you know, people were demanding democracy, the region is going through this rebirth and renewal. Um, most of them, when they even started protesting, they, they never imagined it would become, it would become a situation that's this extreme. So, yeah. Cool. Well, goes for the refugees, what are some of the common countries that they're sent to for resettlement? I think the countries that take the most tend to be European ones, particularly Northern Europe. I believe Sweden does really well. Um, America is supposed to be one of the resettlement countries. And uh, I think in December, someone in the Population and Refugees and Migration Bureau said, hey, we're going to start prioritizing Syrians and take many, many more. But in reality, um, as of December, there had been 302 Syrians settled here total out of the 3.2 million refugees. So there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of um, actual getting people out. Yeah. You guys are quiet back there. <laughs> They're far. Uh, I guess thank you for your talk. Um, based on the last uh, quote there that kind of stuff with me, have you seen kind of a general uh, feeling throughout the refugee population of willingness to return <laughs> to Syria or the different uh, countries of origin? thinking long term and so we go have yeah. left and fixing the countries and especially mm -hmm. the wealthy that leave the resulting brain drain many mm -hmm. of those are people that are going to be needed to rebuild this country so do <laughs> those people have a desire to return or do they mm -hmm. want to assimilate um, you have to differentiate between populations here <laughs> just based on solely on my own reporting people I talk to most of the Iraqis that I meet don't really want to go back. They've kind of given up <laughs> on their country. They think that's enough. I'll just make a new life somewhere else. 
the vast majority of Syrians I meet really do want to go back. And even a lot of the ones in Jordan, they don't want to be resettled because they're thinking, at least here I'm closer. And the way Syrians talk about Syria, like every time you talk to someone, it's like they're about to break into song. <laughs> they start saying, like, Syria, you know, they describe the way the air smells and how the water is and the flowers and the, the lemons and the olives. And um, they, they really love their country and really love their people. So most of them, I think, are pretty set on going back. Or, and, and even if they can't get out and, you know, achieve higher education and go back and rebuild, they'll say, well, at least I'm going to go back and die there. You know, that's, that's, that's my place. Um, thanks again for your talk. Um, you talked a little bit about the differences in attitudes towards refugees in Jordan and Lebanon. And I wondered if, you, in your experience reporting in both of those countries, if one of them was harder or what the different differences were in terms of how easy it was to report and to get, um, on the one hand, individuals to speak openly to you, and then on the other hand, like institutions to to talk with you and provide information if there's a difference oh. between the two countries. Yeah, I would say, yeah, uh -huh. the difference between Jordan and Lebanon was it easier to report in one versus the other in terms of meeting individuals and also institutions that they're willing to talk. I would say, I actually think now um, Lebanon is easier than Jordan. Uh, Jordan was Jordan is easier for me because now I, I live there, so I know a lot of people there. I have the phone numbers of the young people, so I call them until they talk to me. Um, but recently, since I would say November, December, most Jordanians, particularly UNHCR, has been really hesitant about making any media appearances. And I think it's because they feel like their operation in Jordan is at a sensitive point, and they really, really don't want to upset the authorities by you know, going to the media and saying like, oh, you know, like Jordan is deporting Syrians, you know, or something like that. They kind of want to tread the line carefully. Um, so they've been more reticent of late. Um, and Lebanon was not like that. Thank you. Is this thing actually working? Can yeah. anybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Jack, and I'm Consular Affairs at the State Department. I've been in Jordan. I don't know whether you were up in there longer, but uh, Jordan has this really interesting history where Hussein allowed the Palestinians to have actually some rights. I mean, mm. the kingdom, nobody had total rights. Yeah. But, um, and, and as you know from being there, there, there's this kind of tricky situation where 60, 70 percent of the population is Palestinian now. Yeah. But they had rights, and they got into the. They were allowed out. Yeah. You know, after Black September, they were allowed to. They're out in the economy. In fact, they control the economy. And, and I'm, not, yeah. I'm not sure about the about the army. I think the army is still mainly East Bankers. Yeah, but, mainly uh, but, East Jordanian. But the Jordanian. forces are, are mixed in the government and everybody. A lot of Palestinians all through every every you know every aspect you know Jordanian society, like you were saying. And, and so they were able to handle one huge wave, mm -hmm. huge wave of refugees. And all it took was a little bloody fighting when it came to it. But are there any plans? I, I, did you get the impression that Jordanian authorities have been thinking about integrating them in you know, the Syrian or if you, Syrian or if you, it would not upset the sectarian balance because they're all Sunnis, pretty mm -hmm. much Christians. Um, what did you hear about about ideas about if they can't go back, the situation just goes on being insane? You know, are they? I mean, the Jordanians already absorbed one. Yeah, <laughs> a, a wave of refugees outnumbered the population three or four. You know, the original population. I mean, it was pretty daring, and it pretty and it worked. Yeah, they worked in a way, and they can't have an election. They can't have an honest yeah. election. The Palestinians win. Yeah, and they control the government. And the East Bankers don't want that. But but in a lot of ways, that 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 very daring gamble worked. Do you hear anything along those lines? Well, I can't speak to what the government is planning to do since I'm not in on their planning committees. But I can imagine. If they ever did want to integrate the Syrians the way they did the Palestinians and make them Jordanian as well, that I can't imagine that would happen because it, one, it would be so sensitive. I think um, the Palestinian presence in Jordan has also created a lot of conflict and violence. And a lot of Jordanians are saying, because a lot of Jordanians and Syrians are saying, we don't want the Syrians to become like the Palestinians. And I think the Syrians themselves, they want the right to work, the right to livelihoods, and the right to you know, to sustain themselves, but they also want to return. 
I think if you suggest to them, oh, why don't you just be like the Palestinians, that would be their worst nightmare. <laughs> they don't want to be like the Palestinians, and exiled forever, unable to ever return, um, treated as bottom class non-citizens in every country. <laughs> so sadly, I think it's something that they don't want, but it looks more and more like that might be what happens. That's exactly where the Palestinians felt first. Yeah. So, now they don't want it to Yeah. Yep. Hey, Alice, I was wondering, you were talking earlier about, I mean, we're looking at entering the fifth year of the Civil War. Um, as a journalist, what's the appetite for stories about the Syrian <laughs> refugees? So I'm finding talking to a lot of journalists, like, yes, I know, I want to write about it, but my editors don't want to hear it. So yeah. How do you get around that? <laughs> it's a challenge <laughs> because the, the, uh, now we're entering the fifth year of the Syrian Civil War. As a journalist, what is the appetite, appetite like for refugee stories? You know, do editors want them? And the answer is no. <laughs> They're always like, we already know. <laughs> They're there. Life is hard. Okay. Can you go to the front lines and write about ISIS? Um, <laughs> uh, so it's a challenge. And that's why I'm very thankful to the Pulitzer Center <laughs> for giving me support um, to fund my reporting on this. Uh -huh. I mean, the way that I try to get around it is to just think of new angles um, and to try to go deeper into the refugee story. I think it's an advantage for me to live in Jordan and to really get to know the community really well um, and understand what's happening because a lot of foreign journalists Typically, they tend to come to Jordan for one week, go to Zatari camp, you know, take pictures and write, this is really sad, <laughs> this is really sad. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll just see the same story every six months, like someone went to Zatari and it was really sad. Um, but there are a lot of really interesting things going on beneath the surface um, in terms of their legal situation, uh, in terms of, I don't know, child protection, in terms of employment, um, the question of, you know, these foreign workers, what is their actual impact on the economy? Um, I think. I think it helps to just try to dig a little deeper and have some more substance um, rather than pure emotion. Uh, and and that, that's usually how I get my editors to agree. Yeah. Time for probably one or two more questions. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the children, refugees, and how they fit into the educational system? And mm -hmm. also if you came across any art therapy our therapy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, the children, the child refugees is a huge problem <laughs> because they're not being integrated into Jordanian schools. Um, the Jordanian schools are over capacity and they started doing double shifts. Um, so they would cut down their school days and then do mornings for Jordanians, afternoons for Syrians. Um, but it's still not enough. Uh -huh. So a lot of children are not going to school because one, there's, there's no space or two, if they go, um, they feel like like they're not learning well, that teaching isn't good. Um, or a lot of them increasingly are not going to school because children are going out to work. Uh, and this, ha this is happening because uh, Jordan is really cracking down now on Syrians working, taking them into Azra camp or to the borders. So when the fathers and mothers are afraid to work, the children go out. Um, they do things like garbage collection or picking tomatoes in the farms. Actually, something really horrible I heard two weeks ago was that there were about um, 30 kids who were caught working informally, and the public security took them to Azra camp, um, and put them in a, not a detainment center, but it was like a reception area, um, and they were there waiting for family reunification, but then their families are mostly urban refugees who are living out in the cities, and they were afraid to come to the camps because they didn't have, a lot of them had smuggled out, so they were scared, if we come, we're going to get taken in as well. So when I talked to UNICEF, who told me this, they told me, so we just have these 30 kids who are isolated away from their families in the middle of the desert, being held in a camp, um, and we're trying to do reunification, but the families are so afraid, and we're trying to figure out how to deal with it. So it is a big problem. And the and art therapy, yeah, there are a lot of programs that I see with art therapy, and it is really good. Um, I think you know doing things with kids like art, music, theater, um, it really, it's not just a way to occupy them and you know, take up their time, but it really is uh, relief for them. Um, it's a form of psychosocial support. So there are good programs going on. Oh, we finished. Question? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> now we have. Hi, Alice. I wanted to ask a related question, which was mm -hmm. um, whether you'd encountered any unaccompanied minors in your reporting 
Um, so not just children, but children who for whatever reason are separated from their families or don't have their parents with them. And um, if so, where they fit into that system as well and, and what their situation is. Mm -hmm. Unaccompanied minors. I think <laughs> I personally haven't. You mean just on the streets, <laughs> like when I'm reporting? Yeah. Well, unless I don't or know. Did children come without parents? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that. Okay, I can't speak for her Lebanon. I don't know how it works there. I met a lot of Syrian children begging. I don't know if they're unaccompanied minors or not. Poss probably <laughs> a lot of them were, and they're just on the streets. Uh, in Jordan, I would imagine that when they cross the border, if they're separated from their families, the UNHCR tries to take care of them until they can find some way to reunite them. I have met, it's interesting because in Arabic, they call a lot of children, they call them orphans, but usually they still have their mothers. It's just that their father isn't there, but they still call them orphans. So I met a lot of those, but they would still have mothers. Um, yeah, I would, this is a good question. I will look into it. Yeah. All right, if there are no more burning questions, uh, we will adjourn to the main room. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that all of Alice's reporting is on our website, um, and you can access it for free. So she's talking about the in, the in-depth refugee reporting. You know, it's there, and I highly recommend that you all read it because it's very good. Um, I don't think there's anything else I needed to say, but let's um, adjourn to the main room. I, there should be more beverages and um, continue.